Look around. Is the Army creating expert knowledge of land combat? Of course it is. Sergeant Major gave you several examples, precise, finely grained examples of where we are creating new expert knowledge about how to fight in this new environment. We just created a new command for cyber war, a whole new field in the current conduct of warfare. He mentioned the development of resilience in our soldiers. New expert knowledge about how do you get people and help them to develop themselves to be resilient before combat as opposed to just dealing with the trauma after combat. And incidentally, there are two kinds of traumas we're now learning that come out of, there's post-traumatic stress disorder and there's also post-traumatic stress growth. When's the last time you read a study on the growth in the American soldiers? from the combat experiences that they've had and how have we captured that expert knowledge to put it back into our training and development systems. So the first thing that you should look for if you're looking for the Army as profession is look at the expert, at the expert knowledge. Second, professions can have a lot of expert knowledge but if they can't use it, they're not a profession. You've got to have expert practice. And expert practice is done by humans. Remember, professions are quintessentially human institutions. We may use a lot of technology, but we do not practice our art with technology. Let me give you clearly the definition of an Army professional act, any professional act. It is the repetitive exercise of discretionary judgments. That's the definition of what a professional does. I don't care if the professional is a lawyer, a doctor, a first responder, a sergeant major leading a major command? How many times a day will that professional make a discretionary judgment? I chose the word carefully. Nobody looks over a professional soldier and tells them what to decide. There is moral autonomy in the profession because they're the only people who have the expert knowledge. So expert knowledge, expert practice. The third pillar, if you're going to have expert practice, you have to have very intensive systems of developing leaders and practitioners. Leadership. We call it in the Army leader development, but it's clearly the third. It is what connects expert knowledge to expert practice because the practice is done humanly. And if you can't develop humans to practice with that expert knowledge, and I may add to practice ethically with that expert knowledge as the client expects, then you're not, you know, you're really not going to have a profession. So I've just introduced the fourth pillar. The fourth pillar is ethics. There has to be an ethos to a profession. There has to be a set of legal and moral guidelines, and I'm picking my words carefully. We do not have legalists in uniform. We don't want legalists in uniform. We want people who are deeply of moral character, know how to reason to moral conclusions, and can act with moral agency on all occasions. The American people expect that. The ethic is to be the guide to the individual action. It is to be the guide to the institution's action. We have new constraints on the use of force. This is an immensely challenging area for the profession that we need to reassess. We're coming out of nine years of war now with two ethics of force. I spent 28 years in the Army and I only had one ethic of force to worry about maximum force necessary to accomplish the mission. Now there is a second, excuse me, maximum force permissible. Now it's least force necessary. You know, it's one thing to tell a soldier to take a piece of ground. It's another thing to tell a soldier, now change the minds of the civilians who occupy that ground. Because your objective now is the perception of the population. This requires a different approach, applications of different ethics, the other thing that the ethic must do is let me mention two other items. It must be a self-policing ethic. Professions police themselves. We have some amazingly egregious examples of lack of self-policing recently, the most horrendous being the massacre at Fort Hood. Professionals police their own ethics under the principle of meritocracy. Your merit is what should advance you in the profession, nothing else. Merits of competence and merits of character. Only those two aspects are what should elevate 
The ethics should also include such subjects as civil military relations, media military relations. In other words, the concept of a profession's ethic is not just about the individual behavior of the individual per soldier. It is also about the overall state of, of institutional ethics. And I'm sure that's something that we're going, to be, we're going to be discussing. Let me close on a final point, a stark point. The Army is not a profession simply because it says it is, period. The Army doesn't get to decide if it's a profession. The American people will decide. Under research in the sociology of professions in all Western countries, it is the case that the client determines if the profession is in fact a profession. And if you want to know what the client thinks of the profession, watch to see how they treat the profession. Some of you are probably old enough to remember the Army's training scandals at Aberdeen Proving Ground, another egregious example of failure to follow and self-police our own ethics, a horrible example. Shortly after that example, what did the Congress do? Appropriations committees and authorizing committees wrote legislation and told the Army how to do basic training. What an affront, what a back of the hand to the Army. And basically what they were saying is, if you're gonna behave like a bureaucracy, we're gonna treat you like a bureaucracy. We're taking away your autonomy, you have lost our trust. The Army had to work hard and did work hard and did restore that trust. Remember, there's only one currency in the relationship between professions and clients, one, trust. The sick wants to be cured. They trust the doctor. I had a little bout with cancer a few years ago. I was selecting a surgeon. At one point in our dialogue, the surgeon says, you know, part of the time I'm cutting, I'm not gonna be able to see where I'm cutting. And I said, excuse me? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, do you trust me? That, folks, is what this campaign is about. Can we think clearly and seriously about the Army as profession to maintain the trust of the American people through the difficult times that are coming after we come out of these contract zones? I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Don, for your remarks. I'll turn them down to General Franks. Uh, thank you, Sean and General Kaslan. Thank you for including me uh, here this morning. It's my honor to be here on the panel with uh, all of you. And thank you, Sergeant Major and John. Um, I think the last time I spoke to you at AUSA was on, the, on active duty as a trade out commander in October 1994. So I was getting a little pumped up coming in here this morning and <clears throat> my wife Denise now a former army wife we still stay in touch with a lot of people in the army uh, for over 51 years now I said uh, uh, how many great men do you think there are in the world Denise and she I've asked her that a number of times and she always comes back with the same answer one less than you think there are Frank <laughs> so I, I, I don't uh, in any way overestimate Maybe in a sense, I'm a profession of arms time capsule uh, here this morning. But I'd like to offer you uh, three thoughts and then a personal observation from one who was a practitioner in this profession, uh, as many of you, and has since retirement from active duty has been privileged to study, teach, write about, and talk about the profession of arms over the past 11 years at West Point and elsewhere. Uh, first, for me, some fundamentals. The Army profession of arms serves our nation and accomplishes missions at least cost to the members of the profession and trusted to the profession by our nation. The Army profession is made up of practitioners executing the art and science of operations on land to get missions accomplished for our nation in ways consistent with who we are as a people and faithful to our Constitution. The history of our Army profession, despite what John said earlier to you, I think is a history of our nation. A 
As one of those former practitioners, I am inspired every day by what this greatest generation, by what you and your soldiers are doing for our nation these past nine years with great courage, skill, results in Iraq, and increasingly now in Afghanistan. And yes, that painful sacrifice to you, your fellow soldiers, and your families in conditions as tough as any our nation has ever sent its army into. When things got really tough in the mission in Iraq, soldiers and their battle commanders stayed with it. True to your ethos, I will never quit. You went back, and then went back again and again. You sacrificed. You did not quit, even what others did. You taught yourselves how to fight an insurgency while simultaneously growing an Iraqi security force, promoting local and national governance, promoting the public good locally and nationally in the economy and in public works. When the fighting was called for, you did that. When nation creating and building was called for, you did that. Most of the time, you were doing both, alternatively and simultaneously. And now you're still at it, in Iraq, in New Dawn, and now increasingly in Afghanistan. Tough mission, no quit, resilient, battle commanders and soldiers of character, an Army profession of character. I have never seen the Army so focused, so hard, so tough, so resilient as I do now, going on and continuing to serve and achieve remarkable results for our nation. And now amidst all that remarkable performance, you have voluntarily, as a profession, and not because of any crisis or calamity, turned to do an assessment and then a dialogue on the effects of the Army profession of nine years of war, to recommit yourselves to a culture of service and to help yourselves and the Army to refine your own understanding of what it means to be professionals, expert members of the profession of arms. That in itself is powerful and really speaks highly of all of you serving today. My own great personal and professional admiration and respect. Second, as you go about this, I would recommend that how you think about this will determine what you do about it. So in good AAR fashion, something good that really came out of those 70s we've talked about this morning, I would start with this inspiring record of service over the past nine years and ask yourselves, what is it in the profession that enabled us to do all that? What allowed this inspiring, no-quit performance that has achieved these remarkable results? Then you might want to ask yourselves, as Sergeant Major's already done, as General Caslon has already done, if there have been any good but not good enough parts of the profession of these nine years of war, where you might want to make some adjustments or additions for the future as you've already done in so many positive ways over these past nine years. Third, I highly recommend taking the long view, past, present, and future, and be certain to rediscover some unique aspects of this American profession of arms to make it different from other professions. British officer Sir John Hackett in his lectures, the U.S. Army had reprinted as in a pamphlet called The Profession of Arms, argued that in other walks of life, our values, the values you've created, are admirable qualities. But in the Army profession, those values, those seven Army values, those four absolutes of the warrior ethos, are absolutely necessary for accomplishment of your mission. Over time, the Army has developed norms of expected actions 
based on those values. You have stated those four absolutes in the warrior ethos and had lived those so well in the deadly arena of land warfare, they are now embedded in the profession. Selfless service, giving it all for the mission and for each other. No quit. They are now norms. That is how the profession gets its norms of behavior, by demonstrated behavior. As the Army profession, it seems to me, is a concrete, pragmatic one because of the deadly arena it operates in. It's not a philosophy, however much philosophy might inform the profession. It is also a volunteer profession that depends on and has enormous goodwill and generosity among the American people. It is a profession that asks much from its family members, unlike any other profession. It is a profession of, that has been mentioned already, of U.S. Army Reserve and U.S. Army National Guard, now operating as an operational reserve, where active and reserve component soldiers serve shoulder to shoulder with distinction in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous fight. And so every generation, it seems to me, gets to make those choices about professional norms to include defining new ones. It's your turn now. Talk to yourself as you do so well in all manners of professional forum, just like this one. Military space and other electronic connections, Army lessons learned and many others, and reinforce and continue to codify those enduring and indeed those new norms of professional behavior. For as we all know, Sometimes what are absolutes for one generation turn out to be not so absolute for the next. You also get to distinguish enduring professional truths from situation specifics about the nature of selfless service and the nature of land warfare. Lastly, some personal thoughts about being a professional that I was permitted to remain on active duty and continue to serve with great Americans we call soldiers after having my left leg amputated below the knee for me was life's great privilege. The profession for me personally always resembled a calling and a privilege. I said in a Kermit Roosevelt speech in the United Kingdom long ago now that I believe soldiering is a matter of the mind and of the heart. There is much passion, love for our soldiers, and emotion in what professionals do. It is a hard and demanding profession, never so evident as these past nine years. I believe we have to feel it all to know what to do, to put our soldiers at the very best possible advantage and keep that keep them that way in any kind of operation anywhere on the spectrum of conflict to accomplish the mission. That takes character, competence, and leadership, and continuous development in a profession that demands and encourages that continuing growth. Last month at West Point, I was talking about our capstone officership course for seniors at West Point in my duties as the class of 1966 chair in the Center for Professional Military Ethics with Professor Elizabeth Samet, who wrote a great book, Soldier's Heart. She asked me, what is the one enduring truth about being a professional? Well, I had to pause a few minutes to think that one over. I told her, trust. Twenty years ago, a non-commissioned officer in the 3rd Armored Division, just before our attack, stopped me talking about our maneuver plan and said, don't worry, General, we trust you. Now, I could barely speak after he said that, but that non-commissioned officer captured, as non-commissioned officers frequently do and 
you already heard this morning. What we all are doing as professionals and then adapting our profession over time to the requirements of selfless service to our republic to gain the mission at least cost in the deadly arena of land warfare, gain and maintain the trust of the American people, our civilian superiors, our fellow soldiers, and those men and women entrusted to us. Trust. I believe that to lead is also to serve and in so carrying out our duties as professionals in that way, we are in that truck. To serve in that way, as my grandson's class of 2012 at West Point has chosen as their motto, for more than ourselves. Thanks again for including me in this noble work you are doing this year. General Franks, thank you for those compelling and heartfelt remarks. Turn over now to Major General Brown, sir. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks, uh, General Caslin. And uh, sir, uh, just uh, such an inspiration. Thank you for those uh, wonderful remarks. And, and uh, Don, uh, just tremendous uh, as we look. And uh, Sergeant Major, thanks for your, your summary. I feel very fortunate, uh, very humbling to be up here uh, with these uh, tremendous leaders. Uh, I want to look at, uh, I think Walt and I on this end are going to kind of look at the division brigade level and below from our experiences. And I had the unique uh, experience of uh, being a brigade commander, then coming back about three years later to the same area of operations uh, uh, in uh, Mosul. The area expanded a little bit uh, when I was back as a DCG of a division, but still pretty unique coming back to the same area. And, and so, uh, you know, looking at some of the changes, I wanted to start by by first thanking uh, folks that many years ago, 20, 28 years ago, uh, taught me about a, a passion to learn. Uh, when you look at, you know, when I, you, you come in a unit, and I remember the first battalion commander, uh, and you're not too thrilled to get a book to read, uh, you know, Attacks by Rommel or uh, SLA Marshall or Ardant Du Peak. You're like, good God, I've got a million things to do. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And now he throws his book at me. Once a book report, we're all going to talk about it. And, uh, but boy, uh, you know, that, that forcing function, I would have never done it uh, without that. And that forcing function, uh, you know, you start to realize this is a, it's a tough profession. And, and there's so much to learn out there. And you've got to study uh, these life or death situations and learn from those who've gone before you. And it, and it creates a passion that I think when you look in life, fo folks who are successful, they clearly have goals and they have a passion about what they do. Uh, and so, you know, what's been tough as you look uh, over the past nine years is uh, we do that, but not as much as we used to because we used to have a heck of a lot more time, you know, and op tempo is, is one of our enemies in this. And then I also look and I say, you know, the other part of the profession, it's tough, it's demanding, it's an affair of the heart, as, as, as General Frank said, uh, but also, uh, you know, w without a doubt, we're, we're losing some of the fun parts you know, we used to have some parts that were pretty darn fun. I mean, we all have our officers' club stories, our enlisted club stories, our, you know, and some of that's fading away, unfortunately. I think we have to watch that as, as part of a profession. The, the younger folks will look, and if all they see is, is uh, our nose to the grindstone in this tough profession, I think eventually they're going to say, you yeah, know, do I really want to? That's a heck of a lot of work. You know, do I want to be like? But, but when they see the fun, uh, Boy, you, because uh, it is, it can be incredibly rewarding and incredibly fun uh, with the right attitude and, uh, throughout. So as I look over the past nine years, and again, in my two uh, circumstances, just amazing to me the, uh, uh, the experienced soldiers we have out there that are, are, are showing incredible uh, constraint in the, in the lethal use of force. Uh, Split-second decisions, and I think we, we tend to... Uh, you know, as we look at some of the positives out there, there's so many positive things happening. These are split-second decisions that later, you know, the armchair quarterbacks will come out. Uh, but when you look at 99.99% of these young men and women uh, are, are making the right decisions in, in, in uh, incredibly difficult situations and without a doubt probably the most challenging. And as we look at, you know, the, the strategic corporal was mentioned earlier, you know, it's not too many 
uh, times that if you make a mistake, it's it's on CNN, Fox News that night, uh, and th there's no th there's there's not very much forgiveness at any rank, whether you're from private all the way up. Uh, it's it's going to be scrutinized, and so uh, uh, God bless the, the incredible decisions, and and obviously the training that has led them to those decisions. We we can't forget that. I think also uh, there's this huge debate on empowerment. Uh, how much as we look at, you know, wide area security type operations or the coin that we're in, the empowerment that obviously is required, took us a little while to figure that out versus, you know, combined arms maneuver, how much, how much empowerment is required. But we've seen uh, probably one of the most positive things I'd say, uh, you know, in the past, in the industrial age, uh, we, we could get away with a checklist mentality, the enemy that we were facing. Uh, and I'm not saying that was bad at the time. We were still... Uh, you know, incredibly uh, amazing and professional force, but but with a different enemy, different time in the information age, where now, you know, as a lieutenant, uh, in the old days it was the old do something, do anything lieutenant, make a decision. Uh, well now, I mean, look at what, I'll never forget the faces on uh, the first night after we took over in, in Mosul. And we've been trying to, to train, to teach folks this, this uh, agile leader mindset of you're going to be working with a lot of folks, you're going to be doing stuff, you're going to be overwhelmed with the amounts of information. So you've got to train that way. When if you don't, they tend to, you know, the leaders will either wait for all the information, which will never be there. They'll, you know, they'll go disregard the information, which sometimes you see that and say, how could they possibly do that? Well, they're overwhelmed and they just disregard it. Or they pull those golden needles, those golden nuggets out of the haystack and, and they make a key decision that's, that's going to lead to a victory. And that victory may be never firing a shot. It may be talking to a local leader and, and uh, you know, uh, win, winning the day. So, uh, but but in this uh, mindset, it's critical. Uh, I, I remember that that first night, and uh, here's a lieutenant, his platoon sergeant, and there's uh, you know DIA, CIA, two or three other folks with beards. They didn't know who the heck they were. Their eyes were about this big, and they're like, "Damn, sir, you know, you weren't joking. Uh, th this is uh, this is some interesting stuff, and and uh, we got to really figure out how to do this." And they're getting more information and than a division would have gotten, you know, 10 years prior on uh, everything from, you know, fly through to the objective to uh, uh, the, the UAV that's dedicated to them uh, for the mission. Uh, and so, thank goodness we have these leaders that when we talk, you know, uh, checklist mentality versus agility and the agile leader mindset, the ability to, to solve a complex problem in a timely manner with a creative solution. And that's what they're doing out there. The E-5, the E-4s, the lieutenants, the captains, absolutely amazing uh, ability. And I'll give you a quick example of, uh, you know, uh, taxi cabs are being used as uh, SV bids, you know, stuffed with explosives. And there's, in a city like Mosul of 2 million, there's 3,000 taxi cabs uh, that are, that are uh, on the streets every day. So you can't stop every taxi cab. You, you know, you're not going to win the hearts of the people, you're out there and you're going to shut down their, uh, you know, their, their, their livelihood, their, uh, where they need to get, what they need to do. So pretty clever, again, of this, uh, this enemy that pretty devious, hey, load the orange and white taxi cabs and then uh, slam in and, uh, and kill people with them and how do you stop it? Well, a young company commander uh, got the taxi cab union together. I didn't even know there was a taxi cab union as a brigade commander. A young company commander got the taxi cab union together. And, and hey, how are we going to solve this situation? So they developed on there and they said, hey, I, I know what we can do. Let's take the trunks, the lid, the trunk off of the taxi cabs. So you can see they're not stuffed with explosives. Obviously, you can see in the driver's and the passenger's area. Great solution. Developed with, with the uh, Iraqi, taxi cab, Iraqi taxi cab drivers. Uh, well, Al Qaeda knew this was not a good thing. And so they found the taxi cab driver later that day, starting to take his trunk off. They beheaded him. Little no doubt, hey, anybody else takes their trunks off, we're going to do the same to you. Young company commander gets them back together and says, hey, there's 3,000 of you. You all do it. You're more powerful than they are. You can do it, and we'll be there to support you. Next day, I go out on patrol. 3,000 orange and white taxis have their trunks off. Never had another suicide vehicle in a taxi cab again. We had multiple before. They never had another one again. That's an agile leader's mindset. That's some of the positive that are out there. Uh, from empowering these young leaders. So I, I, and I think what happens is we empower and we get those great results, but also when you empower, sometimes you're gonna get the, uh-oh, uh, you know, the, the uh, not so great results, which would happen anyway. 
But people then generally uh, tend to think, okay, well, it's because of the empowerment, so let's rein them in. And I think that's a huge mistake uh, today. And so we have to remember those positives. Um, and when you, uh, when you look at the level of what these young soldiers are doing, I mean, a squad leader is doing, no doubt, what a platoon sergeant used to do. In some cases, what a first sergeant used to do. A lieutenant is doing what a captain, a uh, captain pre-command on a brigade staff is doing what an experienced post-command, post, uh, you know, uh, KD qualifying job major used to do. So, uh, of course, how you train and how you get them ready for that is different. And then what, what they're exposed to is different. And so we have to incorporate these challenging situations into our training. The challenge we've had is with op tempo, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, it's easy to go the range. Uh, I don't think anybody's deployed yet who said, boy, I didn't get, get to the range enough. And of course, you need those fundamentals. I'm not saying that's not important, but are we, are we getting to the next level where we're, we're getting to the ethical uh, dilemmas that are there that occur, again, in split seconds, under duress, uh, in tough, tough situations? And clearly, you know, if you had all the time in the world and you were nice and relaxed, these wouldn't be dilemmas. They're dilemmas because they're tough situations. So are we incorporating that in, in training in our, or are we doing a 30-minute class and checking the block? Okay, we talked about ethics. The lawyer talked about it. Now let's drive on. No, I mean, and, and of course, nobody has white space on the calendar for training. So you've got to incorporate in the training that's already there. Just using the simplest example, like a range, are there civilian targets you have to distinguish between? And are we, are we getting away from... Uh, uh, a checklist, totally rote repetition, which is the tough part is you can't throw that out because obviously you need that. That rote repetition is what gives you the training, gives you that response in duress, but yet there are other factors now that where you need an even greater response under duress, so you've got to train that or, or they just can't, uh, they can't, and that, that's where you run into problems. Uh, also, uh, when you look at, again, leader development, I think is is the most important thing we do, yet with op tempo, uh, even when the leader, and I've been in organizations where the leader talks about it, works it like General Kazan the 25th, uh, privileged to be his DCG for a couple of years, and we work leader development like you can't imagine. Uh, well, there's challenges like modularity. Uh, you know, modularity, the brigade commander, you know, the, the brigade commanders are on different schedules. You, you, you as a division are trying to form this, you know, develop these leaders uh, that you'll deploy with, create this team, uh, but some of them are already there. Some of them will be there a week. Some of them will join you when you're already there. How the heck do you do it? it it's a real challenge. It was a heck of a lot uh, easier when you were all together. I'm not saying modularity is wrong. Obviously, it's the right way to go, and it's fantastic. We've empowered and, and given those leaders that. But uh, in leader development, in, in, uh, uh, it's the first thing that we cut, no doubt, funding-wise, and uh, even in organizations where it's, it's starting to be